So um, Austin Mayor Steve Adler is with us. He's going to be speaking to you in a few moments and introducing our, our presenter. Council Member Rio, uh, Pia Renteria, Council Member Delia Garza, Travis County Commissioner Gerald Doherty, Travis County Commissioner Bridget Shea, the Mayor of Maynard, um, Lisa Bender, Texas State Representative Celia Israel, and Minneapolis Council Member Lisa Bender. Please give them a warm <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize our sponsors this evening who helped uh, produce uh, this event. Uh, the lead sponsor, Capital Metro. So, yes, thank you. We have three supporting sponsors, Garber Engineering, the Real Estate Council of Austin, and Texas Gas Service. And our contributing sponsors this evening, Big Red Dog Engineering, Gables Re Residential, and REATX. Thank you. So the NACTO conference brings some of the brightest minds in transportation and land use planning uh, together for their annual conference. Uh, we are so pleased to have that group in Austin with us today and uh, through the weekend. Um, our speaker uh, this evening, um, I think, has demonstrated that she's a tremendous draw. We're so pleased to have her with us. Um, as uh, many of you from Austin know, uh, downtown Austin, about 47% of the land area in downtown is public right-of-way. So the planning for transportation, Planning for land use in the public right-of-way is so important. When you think about the design necessary to support the needs of everyone, pedestrians, transit users, drivers, and cyclists. So for us, the challenge is how do we enhance the remaining 53% of the land in downtown? And I think that's what we're going to hear about tonight. You know, what Austin is confronting is not unique to Austin. These issues are being dealt with around the world. And so hearing about what other places are doing helps inform us here in Austin what are the best practices. So worldwide transportation movement is reshaping the way cities are building themselves. So I think this evening's presentation is so very timely. But at this time, I'd like to ask Mayor Steve Adler to come to the podium. He has a few words uh, for us to talk about the progress of what's happening in Austin, but also to introduce our speaker tonight. Mayor. You know, we are uh, so pleased to have with us uh, Jeanette Sadakan. Uh, to talk to us. It is uh, Thursday, 7 o'clock, Austin, Texas. We're in a hall. There's a line outside of people waiting to get in. You would think there's going to be some good music in here. <laughs> but Miss Sada Khan is a rock star. And we are really lucky to have her here with us tonight. You know, as, as Austin continues its transition from a sleepy college town to a global uh, uh, city on a, on a large stage, our approach to solving mobility has to transform as well. And on that path, we need guides and teachers. We need folks like Jeanette Sadakan. As commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation from 2007 to 2013, she implemented an incredibly ambitious program, cutting edge, to improve safety and mobility and sustainability. In her current world, work and role at the Bloomberg Associates, 
She works, thankfully, with mayors around the world to reimagine and redesign their cities with, with innovative projects that can be developed quickly and inexpensively on existing right-of-way and spaces. In New York City, she installed hundreds of miles of bike lanes, and the amount of biking, bicycling has skyrocketed. They've done some really creative placemaking, daring to reimagine how public space is used. These efforts have been largely led by tonight's speaker. You know, for those of you uh, that want more uh, after uh, tonight, know that uh, her discussion of bold transportation inventions to create a more livable city is uh, shown on the web. She has a TED Talk that I would urge you all to watch even after this that has had over 850,000 views. You know, in, uh, in New York City Department of Transportation, Jeanette oversaw a $2.8 billion budget. If only we had that here. <laughs> but with that, she has delivered transformative projects like the uh, pedestrianization of Times Square, redesigning 2.3 miles of Broadway from Columbus Circle to Union Square, the, the planning and launch of seven select bus service routes, and the nation's largest bike share program. She's developed and published New York's first ever street design manual and street works manual, defining new standards to create more resilient and attractive streets. I had the opportunity not too long ago to spend some time with Mayor de Blasio in New York. And at one point he pulled, at one point he pulled me aside and he, and he whispered in my ear, he said, you know, Austin, Texas may be the only city in the country that's cooler than New York. I told him I was going to repeat that. He asked me if I heard him say maybe. <laughs> but, but just think how cool Austin would be if we did in this city the things that Jeanette did in New York. You know, she and I have the same philosophy on how to begin addressing a city's biggest challenges. You just try stuff. You try stuff, you fail fast, you keep what works, and then you take it to scale. Some of the initial projects that Jeanette wanted to do were, were introduced as being temporary measures. When, the, uh, when, the, when, the, when Times Square was closed off for pedestrians, they didn't have furniture yet for people to, to sit. And they went out and just bought lawn chairs at the hardware store. That, to me, is a great, let's just try it and see how it works. Those chairs, by the way, became the focus of the news story and were incredibly popular, as were the discussions about the choice of color, which was relatively inadvertent, I understand. <laughs> but trying stuff is hard, and I hope that in your talk tonight, you talk about that. I wasn't uh, just but a couple days ago that I was having yet another conversation about what we're doing in this city, taking four lanes of congested traffic just down the street, four lanes of congested traffic, and taking away two of those lanes for buses and for bicycles. It is. That is counterintuitive to so many people. And it's at where those tectonic plates hit that this city is right now. My own view of that when the conversation, when I get in those conversations is I say, you know, before we talk about going from four to two, let's imagine just for a second if we could put two more in there. What if we could go from four to six? Now, we can't put in six, of course, because there's no room to do that. But if you put in six lanes, 
The question is, what happens in 10 years when we have one million more people in our metropolitan area? How well does that road perform with six lanes? And the answer almost everyone will give you, including the people in this conversation, is that in 10 years that road fails too. Fails worse than that road is today. And if you deny the status quo from the conversation and you talk about where we are and where we will inevitably be, you realize it's not about six lanes or four lanes or two lanes. It's about what we do with the space that we have and how we use it differently than we've used it in the past. That's hard stuff to do. I went to Dublin this summer went there with my wife, I, and we spent uh, the day at the traffic control center in, in Dublin. <laughs> That's because, because I know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> right. The pictures of Dublin nine years ago looked like Lamar and Burnett Road. They look like our most congested streets. And there was a courageous city council that decided to do something about that, and they took steps to change the conditions. Today, today on a project that was initiated this summer, the most trafficked and congested intersection in Dublin nine years ago has no cars on it today. I, I am told, and I mentioned to my colleagues on the council, that almost everybody on that council nine years ago lost their seats. The things that they did are 75% popular today. When Jeanette was starting with bike lanes in New York City, the outcry, as you might imagine, was pretty tremendous. In fact, I understand when they were arguing about that bike lane and whether that should be for bikes or whether it should be for cars, one of the journalists uh, in New York looked at that bike lane and said it was the most contested piece of land outside of the Gaza Strip. <laughs> we need leaders like Jeanette and her leadership continues. She is chair of the National Association of Transportation Officials, NACTO, uh, the conference that we are proud to host uh, this week in Austin, Texas, and has brought uh, half the room here tonight. But there's another half the room here tonight, and those are those of us that live in this city. This is a magical place, but we have challenges and we have a lot to learn. And we are fortunate to have Jeanette here with us tonight to share with us her expertise. Please help me in welcoming to the stage Jeanette Sadakhan. excited about coming here tonight, really excited about coming here tonight, and then it was, uh, you know, the sort of magic that is Austin was underscored when I ended up writing a friend of mine, actually it was a guy that I dated in college, and um, I said, I'm coming to Austin, and um, I, by the way, I hadn't seen him since college, and um, you know, and you know how tricky that can be, <laughs> and um, but he was a, is actually a drummer in the band Asleep at the Wheel. So, and we had this awesome time. And so, again, it's like, wow, you come to Austin, you find old friends, and you make new ones, and it's been really extraordinary. And I know the NACTO family that is here has had an amazing time 
uh, seeing all of the progress uh, that you've made in a very short period of time. So I also want to thank uh, Mayor Adler uh, for hosting us. And uh, although I do think he should get out a little more when you are going to traffic management centers as, <laughs> as your tourist attraction, you know, I, I have some other options for you. Um, anyway, uh, how many of you saw the, uh, were at the mayor's introduction of Mayor Nutter from uh, Philadelphia today? Was that incredible? So he actually focused on Mayor Nutter's skills as a DJ and, int <laughs> and introduced the mayor as, the, uh, as Mix Master Mike. <laughs> and I thought that was incredible. And I thought, well, I don't know how I'm going to top that. Like, do, does Mayor Adler have any music skills, you know, that I could highlight here tonight? So uh, actually, uh, I didn't find that out. Uh, so if anybody knows, we'll, we'll catch up later. Um, but it is great to be here with such a strong and uh, committed mayor, such an active supporter uh, of active transportation. And he really practices what he preaches. He literally walks the walk. It's, inc it's incredible. In fact, he walks every day from his home to his office. <laughs> Do you know how impressive that is? I wish more elected officials did that. In this case, from his residence at the W all the way across the street <laughs> to City Hall. Impressive, impressive, really leading, leading the way, leading the way, <laughs> really. And I have to say, and every morning and evening he does this. And, and yeah, yeah. And even more impressive is his, uh, is his dedicated to, dedication to fitness. You know, I, how many of you have seen his YouTube video? Have you seen this? It is also a thing of beauty. You know, you should, you should check it out. He actually does one-handed push-ups. You, you could demonstrate. You want to demonstrate some one-handed push-ups? Could be a little thing, you know? Could be a new thing. So, um, and he even has no-handed push-ups. You really do have to check out this video. It's, it's quite, quite incredible. You know, and I've learned so much about the mayor since I've come to Austin. Uh, he grew up in D.C. Uh, and his dad was in network TV, which I think explains his fluency uh, with the media. And he actually clerked for a congressman in 1973. And he managed to sit behind John Lennon and Yoko Ono at the Watergate hearings. There's literally a picture of him. So I thought, really, establishing that, that music cred really early, <laughs> right? You were planning this Austin run for a long time. So, you know, he ducked into Princeton University and the University of Texas Austin Law School and, you know, all sorts of stops along the way. Uh, but one of the things that's so impressive about this mayor is that he's so passionate about transportation. And I read one of his first interviews where he said, that we're not going to build our way out of congestion and that we need to be smarter about the way we use our resources. And I couldn't help but thinking, like, have you been to a NACTO conference before? <laughs> it's really good. So I want to thank him for being such a generous host to all of us at NACTO and for your leadership in Austin. So please join me in thanking Mayor Adler for his great work. So it is great, as I mentioned, to be here in Austin and share some of our stories about transforming the streets of New York City. And um, it is also great to be here with so many colleagues and friends. Um, that, the NACTO is one big family, and it's just wonderful uh, to share it here in Austin. You know, the work that I'm going to talk about tonight in New York City, it would, took many, many people to make it happen. There are almost 5,000 people that work at the New York City Department of Transportation. And many of the key leaders that helped make the changes that we made in New York City happen are here in this room. So I want the people from New York City DOT who are here in this room to raise their hands. No, higher. <laughs> higher. So now I want to get a sense from all of you. How many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? Last night, wow, wow. Well, so you guys have a sense of the kinds of changes that we have implemented in the city. And you've, you've seen, literally, the new language that we have on the streets. 
Um, and just a few years, you know, this has been a brand new vocabulary. New Yorkers have actually become fluent in the language of wayfinding and pedestrian plazas and protected bike lanes. And, you know, but it really wasn't always this way. And uh, it's, it's pretty hard to change the status quo, as the mayor noted, and to turn the big ship of a city in a new direction, especially since, like many cities, we had lots of infrastructure to maintain. Uh, as commissioner, I was responsible for 6,000 miles of streets, for 12,000 inter in, uh, signalized intersections, uh, 2 million street signs, uh, what else? The largest passenger ferry operation, one of the largest in the United States, uh, and 788 bridges. So it's a lot of infrastructure. And I actually want to uh, thank my first deputy who was there managing it with me, Lori Ardito, who was there every step of the way and would not have made that happen without Lori there. So Obviously, we needed to change the way we did business if we were going to continue to grow and thrive. We have a million more people that are expected to come to New York City by 2030, and we're not going to get there by doing the same old, same old thing. And as one of the fastest growing cities in uh, Texas, you know a little bit about what that challenge involves. And the mayor told me that you have 110 people moving here every day. And you are not going to meet the challenge uh, of providing a world-class city and keeping Austin weird uh, by uh, doing the same thing that you did 100 years ago. Uh, and you really knew, do need to move beyond this kind of dashboard uh, view of our streets. And for decades, city leaders uh, in many cities looked at streets like this and said, yep, working just fine. That looks exactly like it should. And, you know, Sometimes it's really hard to recall that our streets didn't always used to be that way. In fact, they were more like shared streets, like extensions of our sidewalks. This is a, a picture of Lower Manhattan in 1900. And Congress Avenue, real, right here, really wasn't that much different. And this all changed with the invasion of the automobile. But the shift, it wasn't like this magical shift. It didn't just happen. This shift actually happened by design. These are planning documents um, from New York City in 1922. I love this. This is one of my favorite, my, my favorite planning documents. And you know why? Because of this. First step, yeah, first step, pedestrians are removed, right? And then second step, cars invade, right? This was our plan. It's sort of like Venice, but with traffic sewers instead of canals. And by the 1920s, it was very hard to imagine uh, even crossing the street in places in Brooklyn like Grand Army Plaza. And it just got worse from there. We, the industrial design that we got from Detroit became the main consideration in the design of cities and the design of city streets. And automakers spent most of the 20th century convincing us that we had this love affair with the car, when in fact, I think it was really more of an arranged marriage. <laughs> and this view was focused on uh, moving as many cars as possible from point A to point B. This is uh, Times Square in the 1950s, and by 2008, Really, not much had changed. This was before we did our redesign uh, of, of Times Square. Uh, our streets really have been in this kind of suspended animation for 50 years. And when you think about it, if you were in business and you didn't change your capital asset for 50 years, do you think you would still be in business? So Mayor Bloomberg shattered the status quo when he launched his Plan YC, Long Range Sustainability Plan. And he recognized that we needed to work towards the streets that we wanted, the city we wanted, and not just the inherited Stone Age system uh, that we had. And so we moved very quickly to translate the goals of Plan YC into a strategic plan for New York City DOT. And in fact, it was really the first time that the Department of Transportation had a strategic plan, which is sort of astonishing. Like, you didn't have a plan for where we were going. 
And um, so I really have to thank John Orcutt, actually, who's uh, the policy director, for being really uh, key uh, in helping us design the policies, the programs, and the benchmarks so the public could hold us accountable for what happened on their streets. And we focused on building a world-class bike network, a world-class bus network, uh, creating uh, pedestrian plazas, making it easier to get around, and, and really improving the safety on our streets. And I think one of the things that we became most known for was uh, our rapid transformation of city streets. And moving from uh, uh, years and years of planning studies, you all know how that can go, like years and years and years of planning st studies before anything happens. And we sort of flipped that by, by changing the use of the street very quickly with stones and planters and paints, because that's the key, is to show the potential of that street. And the proof of the, uh, of the success, the proof of the performance, isn't a computer model, but it is how it works in the real world. This was one of our first projects in Dumbo. And I have to say, I don't know how it is here in Austin, but New Yorkers got really tired of waiting years, generations, to see change happen on their street. I think they'd given up, right? I mean, we were like on our fourth groundbreaking of the Second Avenue subway, right? So. <laughs> The notion that, yeah, yeah, plan YC, you're going to green your streets, right, you know? So it was really important to make the promise of plan YC into a reality and show businesses and local neighborhoods what could happen so that they could reap the benefits of safer streets and more foot traffic toward their businesses. So we did this all over the city. Um, this is in lower Manhattan where we created um, the street seats, very much taking a page out of Ed Reskin's uh, work in San Francisco. Uh, to Madison Square, which is one of the, was one of the widest intersections uh, in New York City. And we coned it off in 2008. Um, I love this picture because we put the orange cones out there and this art class just, zzzz, just <laughs> out of nowhere, right? It was like Star Trek. No one there and then zoop, everybody's in there and they're sketching away at the Flatiron Building. It just showed how hungry people are for, for public space. And today, it is one of the most successful public spaces in the city. And in fact, people will sit in the street, in the plaza, instead of going to the park, the beautiful park that's, that's, that's next door. Um, it's really an extraordinary um, program and project. So these new spaces were in demand all across the city. And we focused um, a lot of our work in distressed neighborhoods where there was really no, no green space in places like Corona, Queens, uh, and uh, the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge, you know, which was one of the most dangerous uh, crossings in the city, and we just added new pedestrian space, improved the crossings. Um, we actually created 60 new plazas all over the city, and uh, it was one of the most in-demand programs at the Department of Transportation. And it's interesting because um, one of the things that we did was to flip how it is that government delivers services. So normally you've got like the Department of Transportation that goes in, talks to communities, and, and, and moves forward with the program, right? So what we did was after showing the potential and showcasing some of the possibilities on New York City streets, we converted the program into an application-based program. So neighborhoods applied to us for uh, plazas and bike lanes and, and the other programs. And it's a really powerful way to engage the public and get them involved in the programming. So 60 plazas, and I, I will uh, add one note or Andy Wiley Schwartz would kill me, because Mayor Bloomberg was adamant that we created new public spaces but that they had people that maintained them, that cared for them. Because in the 1980s in New York City, there was a lot of public space that was created but there were no maintenance partners. And so they very quickly turned into distressed areas, garbage pits, and it was really an ugly thing. So going forward, we actually established uh, a neighborhood part, uh, plaza partnership program, and you should find Andy Wiley Shorts, where's Andy? There you are. Um, did a great job at getting communities to come together and, 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 and came up with new ways to actually make this uh, maintenance model work. So these plazas went very quickly from temporary materials all the way through construction. And I think the point is, is that it takes a long time to get through a capital construction program. In New York City, it's five years. So if we had waited the five years, we'd still be talking about many of the projects that we actually have in the streets today. This sparked a downtown 
a renaissance, uh, a culinary resident, uh, renaissance, retail renaissance uh, in Brooklyn. We saw the same results happening in, on Broadway, where we turned Broadway into a, a boulevard, and it became a welcome space uh, for residents and tourists alike uh, who flocked to the shops. Um, and we found in project after project that better streets are better for business. More foot traffic is better for business. This is the area outside of um, Macy's, which we turned into um, a miracle on 34th Street, as I like to say. <laughs> yeah. And foot traffic uh, went up 6% in just six months. And it showed what's possible if you don't force people to fight over scraps of sidewalk space. And that was especially true in Times Square. Um, 365,000 people going through Times Square when we did this project. 365,000 people a day. And 90% of the people going through this area were on foot, and yet they only had 10% of the space, just 10% of the space. And so it was this tangle of traffic. It was this Gordian knot of traffic, and nothing had worked. For years, people had tried to slip lanes, turn lanes, traffic signals, whatever, I, you know, and nothing worked. I am convinced that there was ox cart traffic on Broadway, you know, going back in time. That's how bad it was. So we decided to try something new, close it to uh, cars from 42nd to 47th Street, take Broadway literally out of the system where it cuts as a grid through the, 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 the street uh, grid that we've got there, and we would measure the results. We would do it as a pilot, uh, as Mayor Adler said. And if it worked, we would keep it, and if not, we would put it back uh, to the way it was. Uh, and, and as the mayor pointed out, uh, and that's, that's my mayor, we're, we're measuring it. So, um, and I have to say, he did this in the middle of a re-election campaign. So you might imagine what the conversation was when we're going around City Hall at the table. I don't know if you, uh, the mayor has one of those tables where you ask all the deputy mayors what they think. You can imagine what the deputy mayors thought about closing Times Square to cars in the middle of a re-election campaign. I think it really just shows uh, the political courage uh, and, and, and following the data, uh, which is really what uh, the hallmark is of, of Mike Bloomberg. So, but with any new big project, there's surprises, right? So the surprise, you know, that we had here is we closed it to cars. A lot of people in this room were, were with me when we closed it to cars, got the cones out there, and we looked out. Oh my God, there's nothing there. There's just asphalt. This is gonna be a disaster zone. What are we gonna do? Well, so some smart people got together and said, but we're gonna to go to a discount, you know, hardware store and we're gonna buy some beach chairs. And so we bought $10.99 beach chairs at Pinchink Hardware Store. And uh, so the next day, you know, we, we put them out and surprise, <laughs> surprise, it was this huge hit and everybody loved him. But I gotta tell you with the media, a very important lesson because the media only talked about the beach chairs. Do you, do you like the beach chairs? The color of the beach chairs, size of the beach chairs. Nobody talked about the fact that we'd closed Broadway to cars. <laughs> right? Who knew? Beach chairs. So I'm telling you, any big projects you've got, beach chairs. Think beach chairs. You'll be just fine. Just fine. So it became this instant success. And we, you know, we did uh, all sorts of concerts. You know, and even New Yorkers, you know, grumpy old, curmudgeonly old New Yorkers who said, I would never be caught dead in Times Square. I was trying to do that with Texas accent, it didn't work. Um, anyway, uh, they, they came and uh, they were out there and it was, a, it was a thing of beauty. And it was an economic blockbuster as well, very important for the business community. Six new retail stores moved in, tons of increased revenue. It became one of the top 10 retail locations on the planet, uh, according to Cushman and Wakefield. Um, we had a great, business improvement director, uh, Tim Tompkins, who did great work on the programming side, with doing things like you know, yoga uh, in Times Square. There are these great volunteer programs uh, that we had going on, and uh, open air opera uh, in Times Square. And so you can really see the possibilities that are hidden in plain sight in a city, you know, moving from endless asphalt you know, to this thriving plaza. And now we've got the permanent uh, construction underway, and so you've seen part of it, uh, and there's more to come. So uh, I really invite you to come and, and see it for yourself. It's really uh, going to be quite extraordinary when it's, when it's finished. And I have to say, you know, in fact, I still have one of those beach chairs in my office. 
Um, so it is a piece of uh, New York City history, but it is a piece of history that uh, any city can, can use. But as the mayor noted, um, uh, even Broadway hits can have some bumpy periods, and some of you may have seen some of those local headlines. We had some problems with these costumed Elmos, um, and some women very much out of costume. <laughs> and so we had some people say that the way we needed to solve this problem was to just rip out the plazas, right? And uh, so some people, you know, they, they thought it was kind of like, you know, it was like solving the problem with squirrels with just like tearing out Central Park, right? <laughs> or like the selfie stick problem in Paris. We'll just, you know, remove the Eiffel Tower. So, you know, that, that was the, the strategy there. And it was really interesting to see how many New Yorkers from all over the city rushed to the defense of these plazas. And such a big change in six years from people who thought we were crazy to close Times Square to cars to people who thought it was crazy to open it back up to cars. And I'm happy to say that they're, they're here, to set, here to stay. And this transformation in New York City was uh, just as much about providing more options for helping people get around. And, uh, by bus and by bike and making it uh, possible to just leave your car keys at home. So we took streets like this, you know, where it was sort of bike at your own risk, and we turned them into this, making the street work better for everyone on the street. And these protected bike lanes had a dramatic effect beyond the bike lane itself. And so we found that injuries to all users, not just cyclists, went down 50% on every lane where we put in protected lanes. And retail values went up 50%. So it is part of an economic development strategy for cities. And we tailored our designs to meet the needs of cities, it wasn't of streets. It wasn't the same design all over. So narrow streets, we would paint high visibility lanes. On wider streets, we could take you know, a wider uh, palette. Um, we built in two-way connections, really created this interconnected network, uh, a really true bike backbone uh, for New York City. And we did that from places like Chinatown uh, to uh, all the way uh, uh, to the east side. Uh, and what happened to the east side? Oh, well, we did it on the east side. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of my very favorite projects. Um, and uh, it's probably the most famous bike lane in the world. The most famous bike lane in the world. You heard the mayor say uh, some of our uh, transition work. But what we did is we took basically the speedway. It was a, the community asked us to come in and, and deal with the speeding cars and the people riding on the sidewalks. It was a mess. And so they asked us to fix this like five times. And so we came in and we, and we fixed it. And we put in this two-way protected lane, and guess what? Speeding went down, ridership tripled, it was fantastic. Today, it's one of the best rides in the city, and Ryan Russo does, from New York City DOT deserves a huge uh, uh, congratulations for getting this done. Uh, but, and there is a but, uh, as many people know here in this room, when you push the status quo, uh, the status quo can push back really hard. And so Prospect Park, yes, one reporter called it the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. And the press continued to milk it for all it was worth. And if it wasn't for Seth Solomono, Nick Muscara, and the press team, I think you know, we wouldn't necessarily have gotten through it. And we heard every single reason why these bike lanes wouldn't work. Some people said it's going to be so many people in the lanes that it's going to be dangerous. And some people said it's going to be nobody in the lane, so why put them in? And some people said both things, which was really weird. Um, <laughs> and we also heard some new objections. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a, a member of the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal. And she famously introduced a new word uh, into the transportation lexicon, begrimed. Yeah, she said that these bikes and these bike stations were a, an eyesore that begrimed the city. And um, she also said, I love this, that the bike lobby in New York is an all-powerful enterprise granted free reign by a totalitarian mayor. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> 
so it became really surreal at times. And I have to say, fortunately, we had great support um, from community leaders and activists, people like council leaders, uh, uh, Brad Lander, and I know we've got some uh, progressive, really smart council members in the, in the room, and so I thank you for your leadership. Community leaders like um, Eric McClure and advocates like Paul Steely White, Clarence Eckerson, who did an amazing job with street films, uh, incredible job really getting the message out. And we also had data on our side. And so you can see here that the more people on bikes and the more bike lanes you put down, the safer your streets are. It's a very clear correlation. If you want a safer city, build more bike lanes. Yeah. So that's what we did. And in um, six and a half years, we built almost 400 miles of bike lanes. You can see the system in 2007 and in 2013. I love doing this because it's so easy. Yeah, just bike lanes, bike lanes. <laughs> just, just put them all in, no problem there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So by the end of the administration, though, you know, after all of this change, all of this churning, um, it was amazing to see how much the people were ahead of the press and the people were ahead of the politicians. You can see the numbers here. 73% uh, support bike share. You see 72% support um, the pedestrian plaza. Even 64% uh, approving of bike lanes. If this was an election, it'd be a landslide. It would be a landslide. And so the lesson here, I think, is also that if you, <laughs> good projects will outlast bad headlines. And you really just have to stick to your guns. And we're seeing cities around the world adopt these kinds of strategies. St. Louis, you're seeing it in Tucson. You're seeing it in Arlington, Virginia. And close to here in Houston, even. And right here at home, in Austin. And I've been so amazed seeing this great network of protected lanes uh, that you all are uh, creating, building in better mobility for everybody on the street. And it is really important investment. And part of that better mobility comes from bike share systems, uh, which are exploding around the United States. And this is a picture when we launched bike share on Memorial Day in 2012. And it's a really interesting story. So, you know, I work for a very tech mayor. And, you know, uh, but sometimes when you do press conferences, I don't know if you have any experience with this, uh, it doesn't always go so well, you know? <laughs> like, so sometimes, like, you press the button for the thing to happen, and the button uh, doesn't press. So our press office was very concerned about that. And so they didn't want the mayor to actually put the key in the thing and pull the, into the station and pull the bike out. They begged me to, to I'll do it. Just didn't you do it? So I said, OK, I'll do it. And the mayor was like, if the system doesn't mm -mm work for me, then it's not going to mm -mm work for the rest of New York. <laughs> and I'm going to mm -mm make that key work. <laughs> so you see this picture here. Actually, you know, we had the, all these cameras there. It was incredible. And I am standing behind me in all the pictures. I'm like this. <laughs> I am just praying. I am praying and praying that this works. And it worked, and in two years, we've seen people take 22 million trips on city bike. It's, it's really impressive. It's really impressive. And the team that did that is also here. And one of the things that's really impressive, too, is that we did an incredible amount of outreach. It, we did the most outreach in New York City transportation history. 65,000 people made recommendations about where these bike stations should be, in addition to hundreds and hundreds of community meetings. And Kate Villiers, who's here, Kate, you have to raise a hand. Um, she can give you any details on, on how to get it done, because it was really impressive. And I've been really impressed with the success of the system here, which I hope you know, continues to grow. And you know, the B-Cycle system uh, really, I think, looks great. Buses, and I'm sorry, we do have to talk about buses. Um, they uh, were another big focus uh, of our work. We had the largest bus system uh, in North America, and we had the slowest bus speeds. In fact, you know, you could actually walk across town faster than you could take the bus. And that happened, actually. Actually, there's a yearly competition with a trike and a bus, and the <laughs> trike always wins. <laughs> it's embarrassing. In fact, my transportation, my, 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 my traffic engineer used to say, the only way to get across town was to be born there. So, really not the mark of a world-class city. 
So we got to work creating this rapid bus program, and we rolled it out. Uh, we built uh, seven lines in six years uh, and dedicated lanes, off-board fare collection, so you paid before you got on, camera enforced lanes, so if the drivers were in there, they got ticketed. Um, it, was, it was great, and great results. Uh, this is uh, from uh, our first project on, on Fordham Road in the Bronx, and um, the, it was great for retail sales also, retail sales along the quarter. You know, like in, in every city, when you take away parking, you know, it's like you're taking away somebody's firstborn child, right? And so we took away parking here, and so businesses said they're all going to go out of business. Guess what? Retail sales increased 71% across this corridor. Really important message. Because the fact is, is that cars don't shop, people do. <laughs> so when you build better transit options, you know, people come. Uh, this is also a great project. This is, there's the First Avenue project. Uh, see, before and after, I love that. You've got the dedicated lane, you've got the safe crossing. I remember when we launched Bike Share, I was riding up that bike lane and we're riding along and the cars are flowing, the buses are going and the people are on the ref pedestrian islands. There's rainbows and bluebirds and it was just like <laughs> unbelievable. And so, you know, it's, it's powerful to see what you can do even just repurposing your existing assets just a little bit, just by reallocating the space on the street. Also by taking care of the infrastructure that you put out there. And so we focused a lot on good design. So making really attractive uh, bus shelters, making very attractive, you know, bike shelters, and also focusing on newsstands, um, which was done with a vendor who is also going to provide over a billion dollars to the city over 20 years uh, under this program. Um, we also focused on benches. You know, New York City is known as a great walking city, but there is no place to sit down, right? Which is not great news for parents with kids, anybody, you know, so you, know, you see people just just sitting on these fire hydrants, it's sad. <laughs> so we installed a thousand new benches um, and uh, we also got to work designing new bike racks. Um, our old bike racks looked like some crazed plumber had put some weird thing in the concrete. And so uh, how many of you have had the experience of being lost in New York? Okay, how many of you have had the experience where somebody will say to you, um, oh yeah, it's just two blocks that way? Right? Yeah. Yeah. We've all been there. So, and you know, it's, New Yorkers the same thing. We did a poll and we found out that any given time, New Yorkers were lost 10% of the time. <laughs> and that's, that's just the ones that would admit it. Right? <laughs> so, so we got to work designing a new wayfinding system and to make it easier to find your way around. And we, we did these maps that uh, show the walking time you know, and um, really to, to sort of expand the mental map that, that New Yorkers had of their streets because we all tend to walk within a, the same places all the time. And it was also really uh, important for business. And we did these designs that could fit in different size streets in different neighborhoods. We put them on city bike stations. We put them on subway stations. We put them on our new select bus service stations, real-time bus information. Um, and our streets can also, and this is important, provide unique opportunities uh, for artists. Uh, and I think that's especially true here in Austin because you're, you're this hub, you're this artistic hub. And we found that they can be a canvas for really creative interventions in public spaces. And Wendy Foyer I'm from New York City DOT has done a great job of working with our local artists and I encourage you to get in touch with her if you're interested in that, in that program. And so we worked with our bridge facades. Uh, we even worked with the lowly New Jersey barriers and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers would come out to, to paint these barriers. Um, we worked on the fencing uh, around our uh, equipment yards and we did work on our uh, bike share stations. And we also commissioned um, artists to take our streets in new directions. This is in Times Square, a great program done by Molly Dilworth and it's called uh, Cool Water Hot Island, and she basically translated a heat signature map that NASA took and put it into color. And th so those colors are this river that ran through um, Times Square, very cool. Um, we also created the Summer Streets Program. How many of you have ridden in the Summer Streets Program? So you've, you've seen, we, we closed Park Avenue in the summer on Saturdays um, from the Brooklyn Bridge to 
um, Central Park, and I encourage you to come the first three Saturdays uh, in August. And uh, it really does show also you don't have to use your streets the same way all the time. And you've got a lot of opportunity here in Austin. I'm hoping you do a kind of car-free streets uh, program because it's really incredible to see the imagination that comes along with it. Um, and every year we always try to up the ante, so uh, putting in things like zip lines uh, on our streets. And my favorite, the pop-up pools. Uh, <laughs> so people would really literally swim in the shadow of Grand Central Terminal. Uh, uh, in the heart of Midtown. And all of these projects and programs, you know, they made dramatic changes to our streets, but most importantly in the arena of safety. And uh, focusing on the safety of our streets was one of the most important things that we did. And we had big successes. And a lot of that came from our targeting our interventions. We actually commissioned the largest pedestrian safety study ever done. We studied 7,000 crashes, and it became the Rosetta Stone for us, this who, what, why, where, when of crashes. And the result was that traffic fatalities from 2001 to 2013 fell 30%, the lowest in New York City history since New York City kept records uh, in, uh, at the turn of the century. And yeah, it's really great work. It's really great work. And I am thrilled to say that the new administration is built on that foundation with Vision Zero, you know, and continues to push the envelope with these great uh, interventions. So, you know, I work for this data-driven mayor, um, as he likes to say, trust in God, everyone else bring data. And so we spent a lot of time measuring the impact of these changes on our streets and going beyond just counting cars. And so focusing on safety impacts, on retail uh, impacts, taking a look at what happened with vacancies, taking measuring uh, public opinion. Um, and that was a really big uh, factor in getting our public buy-in for our project. So we went from anecdotes, you know, people like cabbies in New York City saying like, oh, you close Times Square traffic, it's, it's Carmageddon, it's Carmageddon, it's horrible. But when in fact we actually had the studies to show that it worked. So we went from, ana from anecdote to analysis. Um, and uh, it was really improved. And Bruce Schaller deserves a lot of credit. I don't know if Bruce is here. Um, Bruce? Not here? Anyway, he did a lot of work on that, and I urge you to follow up. It's also on the DOT website. And importantly, these studies actually turned small business owners into some of our strongest allies. And all of these lessons were captured in NACTO's Urban Street Design Guide and Bikeway De Design Guide. Uh, along with the lessons learned from lots and lots of other cities. Gabe Klein's work in, in uh, Chicago and D.C. And I really want to thank Linda Bailey and the entire NACTO team uh, for their work because it led to this flowering of innovation uh, all across the country. And focusing on what's possible on city streets, really moving from the renderings to reality. And this really strategy is about flipping the old hierarchy on its head where, you know, instead of moving, focusing on moving cars, uh, above everything else, to prioritizing people on two feet and two wheels uh, and in transit above cars. And last week we announced the latest addition to the NACTO library, the Global Street Design Guide, uh, thanks to Sky Duncan and her crew here. Woo! And it provides great guidance uh, for cities of all sizes and shapes and stages of development. And uh, it's really exciting. Uh, so I think we're in this, at this really important moment, this sort of urban revolution. And it is really exciting to see what Austin has underway, translating these principles into new projects uh, on the ground with bike and bus and pedestrian uh, programs. And I think it's even more exciting to think about where you go from here. And you have the leadership of Mayor Adler and the Downtown Austin Alliance. And you have, yes, and you have the vision, you know, to capture the incredible opportunities that are hidden in plain sight on your streets. And with the energy of everyone in this room, uh, you can make it happen. Um, let's make it happen. Let's get to work. Thank you.
we have we have a few minutes, and I think we can do a couple of questions. And Jeanette is agreeable to to doing that. So um, we're going to be very selective. Maybe two or three questions. Two questions. So we've got a couple of microphones here. Just raise your hand. Does anyone have a question? Okay, we have two questions here. One here, one in the back, Julie. Great. Right in the back. Just two questions. Yes, I have a question. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of the biking and the pedestrian stuff. Um, yeah. One more. But in Austin, I mean, and I know that they have to have the same thing in, in uh, New York City. There's a lot of people that are disabled and not able to ride a bike or walk. How do you take care of that problem with traffic and things like that? It's a really very important point. And I used to work for a mayor, David Dinkins. Uh, as his transportation advisor, and I learned one of the most important lessons in my life from, from Mayor Dinkins, and one of the things that he said to me is that we are all temporarily able. And it's a fundamental and very profound statement about how we approach the design of our infrastructure and how we look at our assets. So we work very, very hard in whether it's the pedestrian plazas, whether it's the accessibility uh, in taxi cabs, in buses, to do as much as we can to improve the accessibility of our streets. I think most cities, and certainly New York, we have a long way to go, but I think we made a lot of strides in terms of trying to make as much of our system accessible as possible. So it's a really important design consideration that I think we can't pay enough attention to. So thank you for raising that. So when you just block off a street, how exciting. Do you make a lot of plans about what people are going to do, or do you just do it and see what no, happens? No, we just wing it and say, oh, people will just figure it out. No. No. Yeah, no, we, uh, all of our projects, we talk to the community boards, the local residents, and so it's part of it. It's an iterative process. You know, you can't just come in. I, I remember I was on this panel with um, Mitch Landro, who was the mayor of uh, New Orleans, and we were on this panel, and he said to me, he, he turns to the audience, he says, yeah, well, Jeanette, she just, she just, does what she wants. She just like makes it happen. She waves a wand and it just happens. It's like it does not happen like that. You know, you don't have like a magic wand and you just make it happen. It's a very intense community engagement process for all of the projects. In fact, I think we have one of the most intensive outreach pro programs uh, in the country. But you, there's never enough outreach, you know. Um, so doing as much as you can to, to look for new ways to do it so that it's not a matter of just being at a table and you know, you listen at one community board meeting and it's thank you for your input and that's the end of it. So really, I think a, a really important thing for us to work on going forward is coming up with new ways to engage the public so that we can get that buy-in and get their creative juices flowing uh, in all of these programs and projects. One last question, Commissioner Shea. With all these new people coming here, we're really struggling with traffic congestion and uh, there's tremendous frustration around it. So one of the proposals that's being advanced is to um, dramatically increase the toll lanes uh, and bring uh, two lanes of high-speed toll traffic onto our lakefront heading into our downtown, which I don't personally favor. But I'm really curious about how you handle the movement of traffic and so many people in Manhattan. There's a big push here for toll lanes. How do you, have you guys dealt yeah, with that in Manhattan? Yeah, well, I, I never, pretend, I try to always stay away from like, here's what you should do. Um, here's the person from New York saying, this is what should happen in Austin. Um, I, 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 that hasn't gone well in the past. Um, I will say as an observation um, that when you build more highways, you, uh, there's this phenomenon called induced demand. And so, Really, you get very little out of the investment when you add additional lanes uh, and encourage traffic uh, to come. So there are different ways to manage it. You manage supply, you manage demand. Tolling is one good way to manage uh, demand. Um, but the way that you're going to build your way out of congestion is not by building more lanes, it's by building transit and by building more options for getting people out of their car and getting around. So I look forward to reading about Austin passing its next rail uh, referendum. So, thank you. Another round of applause for Jeanette. Jeanette, thank you.
Okay, thank you, everyone. Just um, in closing, I'd again like to uh, thank our lead sponsor, Cap Metro, and also our supporting sponsors, RECA, Texas Gas Service, and Garver. Um, appreciate everyone uh, joining us tonight in ACTO Conferees. Have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.